Welcome to Third Floor Views, a production of Chesapeake Family Life, where we talk about health, education, and living with kids. I'm your host, Janet Jefferson. Today, we are discussing how to keep kids motivated during distance learning. Here with us today is Sam Straub, licensed graduate professional counselor at Waypoint Wellness Center and high school counselor at Severn School, and Maria Winters, licensed clinical professional counselor at Anne Arundel Medical Center and professor of psychology at Community College. So thank you so much, um, both of you, for being here today. Sure. Um, to our viewers, feel free to submit any questions or comments that you have in the comments section, and we'll get to as many as we can today. So we're about to dive in um, to another school year. And um, for many of us, that's going to be online. Um, last spring, there were a lot of challenges. Um, and today I wanna focus on how we can mitigate some of those challenges, um, particularly around the topic of motivation. So how can we, um, keep our kids motivated during online learning. So um, I'd love it if both of you just told our viewers and listeners a little bit about yourselves and particularly what populations that you work with. So everyone has sort of a better understanding of your background. Um, Sam, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I began my career as a classroom teacher and moved over to administration and then counseling. So I'm about to enter my 24th year as um, an educator um, and, and most, most all but one year has been working with middle and high school kids. Um, and later in my career, I um, took on mental health counseling. So I'm also, I work at Waypoint Wellness, Wellness Center and mostly see adolescents and adults, um, often parents who are raising adolescents. So my age group, my real love where my heart is, is with teenagers. Maria, how about you? So um, I work conducting psychiatric evaluations at an emergency room. This is for adults and kids of all ages. Um, I also run groups, support groups for adults and adolescents at a psychiatric day hospital and teach psychology at a community college. Perfect. So both of you have a, a just tremendous amount of experience. So thank you for, for being here to discuss this. Um, I wanna start sort of with some basics. Um, what is the psychology of motivation um, and how does motivation work? Like how does it get things done? Um, and Maria, if you could just sort of start by taking a stab at that one. Sure. Um, I mean, motivation is what drives us to do things, right? It was causes us to do things. Um, usually the psychology behind that is that we're inclined to do things or repeat experiences that make us feel good and avoid those experiences that make us feel bad, right? So motivation is that engine or that drive that pushes you towards doing something or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I would add that in, in, in kids, I mean, in adults also, but often in kids, um, motiv motivation is striving for the optimum state of arousal. Mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to schoolwork. So, and what we know about best performance is that moderate arousal produces the best performance. Mm -hmm. Kids don't always stop there. You know, they might prefer higher levels, but, but when, when someone's bored, they'll do something to increase their arousal or when they're overstimulated, they will do something to back away from the thing that's overstimulating them. Hmm. So we're really looking for this sweet spot in the middle and that, that kids especially can be overstimulated. Okay. Yes. Um, how is that different than adults? Or would you say that adults are very similar in that respect? I would say that the psychology is the same. The difference is brain development and that adults can override some of the sort of more basic and instinctual <laughs> urges because they have much better executive functioning. Uh -huh. Um, and then thinking about kids of different ages, um, so like maybe starting with those early middle school years where you're just starting to um, understand um, abstract concepts, um, how does that change? You know, are, are they the same just as teenagers or are maybe they less susceptible to some of these desires? Um, one of the things that happens during the teenage years, and this is no surprise to anyone raising a teen or who was a teen, is that um, priorities really shift away from the nuclear family and towards friendships. Hmm. And so um, 
so motivation is not just like getting your body to feel how you, how you want to. It's also serving some pretty deep core needs and belonging is one of them. So one of the things that I think really distinguishes teenagers is a, a deep need to feel connected, particularly at the peer level. Mm -hmm. um, and that does permeate school experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, a point of competence, I would add as well. You know, when I'm thinking about doing school work, which is what this conversation is about. Right. Um, like a need to feel uh, like like they have their act together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we find ourselves in, a, in very unusual times right now. Um, how has the pandemic changed motivation um, or, or has it, you know, is it just this base need um, that, that stays the same and it's only the situation has changed or has it really um, you know, made, made things more extreme, you know, are, are kids going to be now even more concerned about relationship building or, um, you know, more, um, engaged with, um, making sure that they're, they're aroused in some sense. And um, what do you think, Maria, especially since you're finding yourself, um, you know, in more of a medical center? So I have found that this pandemic has maybe brought a decline in motivation, um, but because, it, you know, if we think of there are different things that are related to motivation, one of them, like Sam was saying, is it has changed how we relate to others. And if that is a source of motivation, it's going to affect our motivation as well. Mm -hmm. um, when we don't have basic needs met, like our sense of security that is at risk right now, or we feel more vulnerable, we have so many worries in, in our heads right now that that is going to not let us meet those basic needs that are needed also for motivation. So I, I do think there is an effect on motivation for sure. Um, that doesn't mean it's gonna stay there. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we're learning new things and new ways to motivate ourselves and our kids, but it, it's, it's real. Mm -hmm. In the spring, the school where I work um, was fully remote and we were doing a lot of synchronous um, learning. And so, and I, as a counselor, was doing check-ins virtually over Zoom with my students. And um, to a one, not a single student that I spoke with did not report some sort of decline in motivation in the spring. Mm. Um, and, and it was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was sort of a slow slope, but it was, it was sort of the progressive lack of contact with their peers, the lack of novelty, the sort of the buzz that the school days provided that wasn't happening for them. And, and in the beginning, some were just fine with that and some were fine with it for quite a long time, but towards the end, um, it, it got, it got heavy mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's, you know, it was harder to kind of get jazzed up to do something that they weren't inherently interested in, um, such as their schoolwork when they were tired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, so vir virtual learning is, it sounds like it's definitely going to make this only harder um, because you're not having that, those really, or it's harder to build those relationships. Are there other reasons that virtual learning um, is sort of uh, a challenge for motivation or, or not on our side? Well, it requires you to tune into a screen 20, like to, for, for all of your input. And we're not really wired for that. We humans mm -hmm. like to take in cues to perceive things in a sort of subconscious way. We like to bounce off of our of our peers and our environment and we're not getting that. So there's kind of this element of uh, feedback from our environment that we are not receiving when we're doing virtual learning. And there's a heightened level of focus on this singular way of receiving information that um, really works well for some people and is harder for others. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, that's a, that, that plays against us. That said, I, um, I would put a lot of money on the fact that most, if not all teachers did a lot of training this summer to get ready for this mm -hmm. fall. I know my school did, and I did hours and hours of it. Um, so the experience that kids had in the spring and even the experience that kids had at my school in the spring, it's going to look different in the fall. We simply had enough mm -hmm. time, better time to prepare. We knew what we were getting into as opposed to having quite literally a weekend to turn it around. And, and that's the hope, right? Because I think what we experienced those last three months decreased motivation significantly because mm -hmm. it was an improv game, right? It was crisis mode. So I agree. I mean, the hope is that we're going to encounter something completely more supportive and different than what we encountered yeah. before. 
Mm -hmm. I think that that is, that's one of the things that I, that the conversations that are um, leading the day as we in my school lead up to or begin the start of the school year, there's a, a big focus on student wellness. We're, mm -hmm. we're thinking not just about delivery of content and teaching and learning, which is very important, and that is the business of school, but it's also how are we going to reach our kids and their families, because some of our usual avenues are not available to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it sounds like the school potentially will look a little bit, or online learning will look a little bit a different, bit different this fall because there's been more time to prepare. Um, but what about the kids? What is, uh, how are kids feeling after now they've been through this summer, which is going to be different from any summer they've experienced before? Do you think that that's going to impact motivation in the fall? Are they maybe even now more eager to return to school before, or do you think maybe they've just sort of slide, uh, slid deeper into that slump? Maria, what, what are you seeing? You know, Janet, when I hear that question, the first thing that comes to mind is that, um, and I, Sam might agree with me, we could probably give, you know, have our opinions about this, but right now it's so important to actually ask that question ourselves. What mm. specifically motivates my kid, right? Mm. And the only way to do that is asking them and gather that intel. Like I... I've been hearing of all these parents trying to figure things out and assume and, and try to guess what their kids need. And I'm like, okay, hold on one second. Have you asked? And usually the question is like, no, I have. So, you know, to answer that, I, I wa want us to first be mindful, go ahead and ask so-and-so what, how are you preparing for this? What's something that as a family we can do to raise our motivation or to, you know, be, feel more prepared to what's coming? What, gather that intel and then come up with a flexible plan once you have that info, but ask, 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 ask. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Yeah. I think that makes so much sense in terms of communicate. We need to be better at communicating maybe now more than ever because, um, not only do we, um, we're not seeing people in person, so we're not maybe as attuned to those um, bodily cues that we would see otherwise, but we're also not seeing as many adults or students are not seeing as many adults as they would otherwise, you know, a lot of those that FaceTime with, with different people just isn't happening quite as much. So I think it needs, uh, there needs to be more communication now than ever. Um, and Janet, I'm sorry, and, and some kids, I mean, I understand the majority are finding this harder, but some kids are having the time of their lives going online. <laughs> like, I mean, some kids are like, oh, this, I, I can do this, no problem. And sometimes what they need to feel motivated is just, I don't know, have a bucket of snacks right next to them. While they're, I, you know, like it can be simple or it can be very complicated, but we would not know if we don't know. Yeah. Right, right. Absolutely. We got to ask. Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper into that. So what can parents do to help motivate kids um, this fall? So I love that idea of ask and communicate. And I think that's so obvious, but so easily forgotten. So um, yes, yes, exactly. Um, what else um, are you suggesting? Um, Sam, what are you suggesting that parents um, do to help motivate their children? Well, first of all, Change, lower your expectations for what motivation should look like. That's the first thing is, is this is not like, none of us have ever done, delivered or gone to school in a global pandemic before. Mm -hmm. None of us have ever done school, com, you know, completely online before. Although some, there are schools that are online, but this whole taking a full brick and mortar school and putting it into Zoom or, you know, uh, Google Meet, rectangles on a square. Um, this is new territory for all of us. So don't expect, you know, you, even if you have a highly motivated gung-ho kind of kid, which we don't all have, I would, ex I would lower the expectations for, for every kid's levels of motivation. So that's the first thing I would say. Mm -hmm. And um, what we know about what motivates kids, uh, we know a, a bunch of things, but I think of relationships, those are motivating to kids. So when they feel connected to their peers in the classroom and to their teachers. And so to help facilitate that, teach, parents can reach out to teachers, help them get to know their kids. Um, I read an article recently, it was wonderful, about a, a practice that a parent uses several weeks into 
the school year, the parent notices specific anecdotes or things that are coming home by, by way of the kid and then sends their teachers a thank you note. Thank mm -hmm. you for, for doing this. This is the story that came up at dinner. I just wanted you know to appreciate it. And then also here's a little info and intel about my child. Mm -hmm. So parents can help facilitate the, parent, the child um, teacher relationship. Mm -hmm. And unlike in the spring, when we went into remote learning, we were on a stay at home order. And so there was no, there was no in-person socializing you know, allowed. And depending on what your household comfort levels are with that, that is another thing that parents can assist with is making sure if, if there are, if, if you have permission to do so, you know, if, if this is something that's within your comfort zone, that your kids are socializing to the extent they can under all of these restrictions. So relationships mm -hmm. is one and relevance is another. So when kids feel that what they are learning is useful is relevant to them. Mm -hmm. Now teachers know this. So hopefully they, when they set up their, their lessons, they are explaining why they're setting up their lessons, like what it is that this skill or content does on behalf of the kid. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the kid that, that, that might, that still might not do it. A kid might say like, okay, so I have to know this for whatever, you know, a standardized test or something. And kid might say, I still don't care. So a parent is in the position to say, well, what might the process of engaging in this work do for my kid? Not the gaining of the content knowledge, but how does my kid stand to grow or change positively by engaging in the process of doing this hard thing? Hmm. So like, hey, you know what? You have been talking about the fact that you wanted to improve your writing. You may not like what you're writing about, but this is just another opportunity for you to, to polish that skill that you were looking for. Or, you know, you've always said that, um, uh, you know, you wanted to get better at class discussions. Well, guess what? This is a debate and you're going to be learning to participate. I know you don't care what you're talking about, but this is a skill that you've been looking forward to developing mm -hmm. or a strength that you own that you can bring to the table and share with your peers. And that's going to be kind of exciting for you. You know, mm -hmm. so parents can look at n ways that they can spin the work to make it feel relevant and useful for a kid's eventual growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing again, relationship building is so important. Uh, again, communication, um, not only with students, but with teachers um, and, and really thinking a little bit more about process instead of product um, and explaining that explicitly to your, to your child. So sort of drawing the curtains back a little bit on why we do what we do and um, maybe engaging them a little bit more on what it actually looks like to be an adult and the choices that we make um, and, and how we go about making those choices. It's like, well, I don't really want to do this, but it's good for me in the end. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to practice this. Yeah. The thing is though, that that'll help if, you know, that, that will become hard. Kids can only do that for like, it, and so we're going to see if, if your child is someone who you are always have to prop up in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you'll see over time, they need a break from that. So, so that's another thing parents can do to keep motivation solid is make sure there are some breaks from monotony or, or, or heavy lifting, heavy mm -hmm. mental lifting. So that might mean like weekends, mix it up, go for a hike as a family. Or um, if a kid is just like spinning their wheels and steam's coming out of their ears, say, go out and play. Mm -hmm. Come back in 20 minutes and try this again. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the things that can help reset motivation. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and something that you said that is key, uh, be as parents, be kind to ourselves. You know, okay. we started that way. And it's a good opportunity also to check in with ourselves on where is our motivation as parents, because we mm -hmm. also, I don't want to put any pressure because again, be kind to yourself and, and you know, we're on these, you know, experimenting with all these, but once we also know where is our level of motivation, kids, kids absorb, kids watch, kids listen. So if we, you know, also keep an eye on that, we can, it can be contagious. Motivation can be contagious too. Mm -hmm. So just to, you know, be mindful that we can be aware of what kind of environment we are creating at home as well, without pressure again, because this is a crisis. <laughs> right, right. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, reward systems um, and intrinsic versus um, uh, external rewards. Um, how much that, does that depend on the kid? As parents, should we be worried about using reward system um, 
And then of course, if we're talking about rewards, you know, should we look at more of like the negative consequences side of things? Um, how do parents navigate this, especially knowing that it's a really weird time and um, this is very exceptional? Um, Maria, let's, let's start with you on that. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna sound redundant, but I mean, if I would get to answer this question before um, pandemic, it would be yeah. a completely different answer, right? And I'll, and I'll answer, but before I do that, give yourself some slack. Again, you know, if, if, you know, if what works at that moment is finish this and I'll give you the biggest candy ever and that's, you know, who am I to say, don't do it, you know, as long as you know, it's not causing harm to yourself or to the kid, but okay. So, you know, this is different. So um, I believe, you know, that as long as we don't use any reward as contingent, like if you do this, then you get that. Because my, my fear with that will be that then we might decrease their own natural um, intrinsic motivation to do something and then create that expectation that every time I do something, then I'm going to expect something in return, right? Because we, not all the time, we need to reward behavior, especially if it's, you know, their natural curiosity and interest on in doing something, we don't need to reward that. I am a firm believer of verbal praise as to use it as a reward, right? With any age. I haven't met any kid of any age that doesn't like, or adult, that doesn't like feeling appreciated, right? As long as this verbal praise is specific and not good job, you're awesome, and then good job, you're awesome, because then it's kind of empty. If it's specific as I, I saw the great listening skills you showed during your class, online today, or I saw how you raise your virtual hand and ask a question, great ability to ask for help. As long as it's specific and is focused, like Sam was saying before, on the process and not the outcome, then that's huge because we, especially now, we don't need to expect that they last a the whole day in class being participative and, and all that. But if we reinforce and reward the process of it, you were able to sit in some classes, participate, then, you know, if self-esteem goes up, motivation goes up and, you know, magical things can happen. I think it's, I think um, with some kids though, especially kids with any kind of um, executive dysfunction, like ADHD or learning differences, they sometimes do need like really concrete markers to help them get to the, to the goal. So I would say helping them break things down and break larger assignments down into smaller chunks. Um, and again, teachers should know how to do this, but your kid may need it broken down even smaller. Um, and it might not be like, hey, you know, get, get this done and you get M&Ms, but it might be that for, for, especially for younger kids. Like I hope we're not still doing that for 17 year olds because you know, their next step is um, you know, college or employment or something, right? Um, but but it, it, it might be that for some of our kids who's, who are still learning to regulate themselves. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you take something that a kid is already, that, that a kid wants to do and that you are inclined to say yes to anyway, and you take a job that the kid wants to have done but can't seem to get themselves to do it, so like you're on the same page here, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, for example, in my, like a high schooler who, how about summer reading? How about we take that? Because that's what I think a lot of kids are dealing with at this very moment. Like the start, the start of school year is coming up and some of them haven't finished, but they want to finish. They don't want to go to the start of the school year not having done their work. So they say, hey, you know, some people in the neighborhood are getting together to go hang out at some park. Can I go? And you want to say yes so you say yes but your ticket to go is that you make a little dent in your reading mm -hmm. and I'm going to suggest you go upstairs and do that right now because mm -hmm. you're going to say yes they want to do it and and if you say if you deliver that in the right way the kid's going to feel like okay mom or dad is like pushing me in the direction I know I already want to go and not feeling nagged mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that's the fine line with adolescents by the way is mm -hmm. extrinsic and intra you know carrots and nagging <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So what happens when things don't go well, when you find yourself with your, your child who's really unmotivated and you feel like you've tried sort of all the tricks or tools in your own um, toolkit, then what? What suggestions um, do you have? Um, and then sort of to know where we're going with, my next step is going to be like, and when do you call the professionals? Whether that be... Um, uh, you're reaching out to um, your teachers, your um, in-school counselors, but then even beyond that. So someone really more like you, Maria, where you're, you know, when do you really need um, to step up the game and, and seek more professional help? Are you asking um, for kids or for the parents? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking for the kids, but that's a great question. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that's important to remember too, is that um, we're all struggling right now. Um, and and we're, I think we're all sort of bracing ourselves for, okay, we have to jump back into this um, deep breath. Um, how can we steal ourselves, which is sort of a, um, um, a less than desirable space to be. Um, so, um, so what do you think, Maria? What, um, what do you do when you have a student who, who, um, where a parent needs extra help to support the student or the student needs extra help to move forward? Well, I think it, 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 it's tied to your next question. I, my first thought is ask for help. Right. I mean, you have teachers on board, you have other parents on board, you have your own kid to, again, ask how we can, you know, brainstorm as to what other things can we try? What, what options do we have? Um, but to jump then to the next question, which I think is key, when to get professional help. Um, I mean, knowing that kids naturally are more, are, are usually resilient, right? And, and probably dealing with all these better than us adults. Mm. Um, and, and also knowing that we don't have to be at our lowest to get professional help. It doesn't, we don't have to wait until there's a crisis to, for professional help, actually help can, this help can help you maintain what's working or prevent getting to that crisis. But, you know, a good um, recipe that is what I give my college students when we talk about this is um, what the three Ds, right? So the first D is distress. If you're noticing on your kid that whatever feelings they're having, um, behaviors or thoughts are causing significant distress, because we're all feeling distress. I haven't met the person either that has said, oh, this pandemic is being wonderful, no distress here. So having that in mind, but if the distress is, um, you know, being affecting the way that they, you know, affecting their functioning, right? Affecting the ability that they have to go with school, complete the class, do the homework, um, maintain satisfactory relationships with other kids or adults. If, if it's affecting of all that, then we go to the second D, which is dysfunction. So if we have out of proportion or out of the norm distress mixed with dysfunction, it is a time to get help. Why not, right? Help, professional help is a resource like any other. So if we have it available, why doing it alone? Use it. And the third D is actually when asking for help becomes non-negotiable, which is danger. So if we are listening to our kids um, expressing feelings of hopelessness or helplessness, any thoughts of death, any comments like, I, this pandemic is not over, I'll rather be dead, or I just don't feel like waking up tomorrow, that's, that's when we automatically call because that's something that cannot wait for you to set up an appointment with a therapist. That's your 911 call, your drive yourself to the emergency room or a call to our county's crisis response who they do a great job. So I completely agree with everything Maria said. And I would also add that knowing the chain of command and communication at your child's school will help um, with data gathering around whether you're at the point of manage this in-house and get some additional, you know, parenting tools, or I think I need to call in some support. So um, if you are unsure, so like some parents are going to be sure, I know my kid's cracking, but if you're like, I, I'm not sure, then I would say contact whomever it is you should contact based on how your school works. So it might be the classroom teacher if you have an elementary age child, it might be the, the subject level teacher if it seems to be a specific um, issue in a class, and it might be um, 
like me, my role as school counselor. So it might be school counselor or advisor or, um, you know, some sort of dean of student type vice principal. I don't, you know, it depends on how the school is structured, but someone who would have a, an eye on your kid or would have, be able to put an eye on your kid at the school level and then give you feedback. Absolutely. That's really helpful. Let's um, end with one last question. Um, really briefly, what is one positive thing that you feel like um, we can look forward to this year? Sort of to end it on a positive note, um, where is something that you're hopeful um, or what is something that you're hopeful about? Sam, let's start with you. I think that we are we are already, I mean, I, I, the school year hasn't started and I mentioned at the outside of this interview that the conversation behind the scenes is about student wellness. And I think so, for so long, our kids have um, been slowly bearing the brunt of what I would consider a broken college admissions system that's trickling down and causing um, kids to have to jump through really unnecessary and, and developmentally not appropriate hoops um, and, and their wellness, their sense of well-being is what has been perhaps set by the wayside. And so um, I hope that, that what comes of this, and I think it will, is a recentering of student wellness in the foreground and thinking about teaching the child first and your subject matter second. How about you, Maria? Well, um, I'm hopeful that um, we will survive this. We are doing a great job. This is temporary. We're, we're learning so many new skills. We're, you know, we're getting over comfort zones, which is making us, you know, being creative and, and, you know, being mindful of all the things that we're capable of doing. And like Sam said, I cannot agree more. We are going to start talking even more about the importance of emotional well-being of our kids and ourselves. Now it's going to be, my hope is that it's going to be an open conversation that is something that we have in common and and the realization that without emotional well-being and mental health nothing else you know is going to happen so it's beautiful that we that's one of our focus and I'm, I'm appreciative of that and we can do this is is we're doing an awesome job <laughs> Well, thank you so much both to Sam and Maria for being here with us today to address our many questions about uh, motivation and our students this fall. Um, and thank you to all of our viewers and listeners as well. Make sure you visit chesspeakfamily.com for up-to-date local information on home, health, and living for today's Maryland parent. This episode will be archived on chesapeakefamily.com in video and podcast format. I'm Janet Jefferson with Chesapeake Family Life and Third Floor Views. Thanks so much.